whether or not we need a bunch of digital dolezals running around. Digital dolezals. Identify as black. Digital dolezals. Big up the whole island massive, it's your boy Chad. I would say the answer is no. Welcome back to Wine and Chill. I'm Stephanie, your favorite recovering lawyer, and today we're talking about AI, artificial intelligence. For those of you that are new here, I worked for the better part of six years as an attorney in tech, different parts of tech, specifically MarTech and FinTech, so that's marketing tech, where I saw the introduction of the beginning of predictive analytics, machine learning, and what we are now calling artificial intelligence. So let's get into it, particularly what are the legal issues that arise out of AI? What is going on with the rampant appropriation? It's giving appropriation on steroids. And how can we utilize machine learning, aka AI, in an ethical way? So let's get into our agenda. First, we're going to do a bit of background so that we understand the basis of AI. So we're going to start with large language models. Say that fast three times. My engineering friends would be very proud of me that all of their lectures paid off. And yes, I have a very decent understanding. Then we'll get into the blind spots of AI academia. And those blind spots are usually colorblind spots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the big question of artificial intelligence, which is literally a legal Pandora's box. We'll get into IP ownership questions, protecting artists and your privacy rights. We'll discuss digital dolezals. It's giving appropriation on steroids. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk about whether or not we can use platforms such as ChatGPT as a source of truth, or are they just giving fancy fables, illusions, hallucinations, as their parent company is now stating. And then we'll close out with the future is iRobot. Just kidding. It's a little bit more hopeful than that. On to large language models. So y'all know I love a good definition. definition. Let's start with the definition. What is generative AI? Generative AI refers to artificial intelligence that can produce perceived novel content, emphasis on the perceived, allowing anyone to create without the specialized expertise or tooling. So most famously, this newest version of ChatGPT was released in November of 2022 with everyone, their mother and their aunt using it to see what exactly can it do. For example, I use ChatGPT in this specific YouTube video and ChatGPT helped me create a catching title. As you can see from the title, it's quite long. That's because the video had a lot of nuance. I wanted to include a lot of different themes and it did take a little bit of practice with training ChatGPT specifically to give me something that sounded humanistic. So while it didn't exactly give me a one-to-one -one for the end product, it did heavily help me in creating a shortcut to find a good title for the video. So there are some helpful uses to that. And with those helpful uses, there are actually a lot of harms, which we'll get into in a second. First and foremost, this technology is not new. It's simply the first time that it's been offered on a wide international scale where all you need to do is log into ChatGPT and a chatbot will do anything from have conversations with you, provide you answers to your essay questions. That is also cheating. Pay attention, kids help you write titles for YouTube, and maybe serve as a resource tool. However, the answers it gives, yeah, it needs a little bit of work. The basis of today's current AI is machine learning. I would say the most practical application of machine learning that most people in the US are familiar with is predictive analytics. Particularly if you live in the US, you have to shop to buy various things and items. So predictive analytics, most likely if you use an email address has found its way to you. For example, a few of the MarTech companies I worked at use predictive analytics, which was simply machine learning. So the way it works is you go into the store, you buy earrings preferably glittery earrings, something eye-catching, something that brings your heart Marie Kondo joy. You buy the earrings, next thing you know, a week later, you get an email in your inbox, hey Stephanie, I think you would like these purple earrings, and you think, wow, this company really knows me well. No, they don't. They simply took your information, they noticed that you have a buying habit at certain times of the year that you want sparkly earrings, and they inputted your information in a larger data set of other people that also like sparkly earrings. It wasn't artificial intelligence, it was simply machine learning. It's essentially very expensive and educated guessing. It can guess your spending habits based on the fact that it's ingested a lot of data about you. It knows what times of the year that you like to buy, um, makeup for example, etc. You would be surprised at the amount of information that these retail companies have collected on all of us. And by surprise, I mean startled. 
but that's a conversation for another time. So what exactly is a large language model? A large language model is a type of neural network. A neural network is a type of machine learning model based on a number of small mathematical functions called neurons. Like the neurons in a human brain, they are the lowest level of computation. Each neuron is a simple mathematical function that calculates an output based on some input. The power of the neural network, however, comes from the connections between the neurons. I love how to engineers are like, this is simple math. And to me, where math is not my ministry, I'm like, I've seen that background math. It's not all that simple, but yes. If you have a math-minded brain, it is somewhat simple math. So a large language model, the interesting thing about it is at a certain point, it starts to build itself. So you build the data set, you build the functional algorithm of how it ingests the data, and then it is now trained to continue building according to the parameters that the programmer has set. So what is particular about a machine learning or AI model, however, is that rather than writing those instructions explicitly, the human programmers instead write a set of instructions, an algorithm, that's all an algorithm is, a set of instructions given by a human to a machine computer program that then reviews large volumes of existing data to define the model itself. As such, the human programmers do not build the model, they build the algorithm that builds the model. And that part is important because again, there is a human component and in the end, humans control all of machine learning. Because if you build the algorithm to be fair, ethical, to take in all types of information from different types of people, an algorithm will do the right thing. If you build the algorithm to be biased, to only care about certain complexions. You see where this is going? So the root of the problem with machine learning and therefore artificial intelligence is twofold. Who built the algorithms? Are all of these people similarly situated? Is it very hegemonous? Hegem, I always say that word wrong. Hmm, we'll see. You can correct me in the comments if it's wrong. And then two, what is the algorithm then programmed to find? What types of data sets? Which, spoiler alert, a lot of the information from ChatGPT is coming from Reddit. Reddit is not peer reviewed. Reddit is barely Wikipedia. But I don't want to raise your blood pressure too high yet. So one of the things that should, you know, lower all of our blood pressures is AI is not sentient, babe. It's not sentient or going to be sentient anytime soon. Essentially, AI is a stochastic parrot. But since it does ingest such large amounts of data sets, larger than we've ever seen before, it does have the ability to manipulate data, present false information, and cause massive amounts of harm. The paper on the dangers of stochastic parrots, Can Language Models Be Too Big? by Emily M. Bender, Timnit Gebru, Angelina McMillan Major, and Shamargaret Schmitchell, who are all noted AI researchers, they define stochastic parrot as, contrary to how it may seem when we observe its output, an LM, language model is a system for haphazardly stitching together sequences of linguistic forms it has observed in a vast training data. According to probabilistic information about how they combine, but without any reference to a meeting, a stochastic parrot. So essentially, you can literally take a bot, put the bot onto Twitter, let it ingest all the information solely to Twitter. The bot is going to come out a raging racist. Actually, this has happened already, and in literally 24 hours, it decided to spew out anti-Semitic, racist, all types of horrible nonsense. Because again, the data set it ingested was Twitter, which is literally the devil's playground of chaos. So what's really the worst thing that a large language model can do? The paper, which I've linked below in the description box, you should read it, gives us insight into how we should deal with AI, in that AI can be a helpful tool to modern humans if we program the algorithm to, again, be ethical, ingest information from all different types of places, preferably verified information, and make sure we pay attention to where the data sets are coming from to ensure that we are not stealing copyrighted work. The paper then goes on to weigh the financial and the environmental costs. For an AI to function at this manner, you would essentially need probably a large data farm, which data servers, if you didn't know, take up a lot of water. And you know, humans need water to survive. So do plants, animals, insects. 
One important thing to note, OpenAI, who is the parent company of ChatGPT, the reason why there is a lot of pushback against OpenAI and specifically ChatGPT is because they refuse to allow researchers that do not work at the company as well as the general public know where the data sets are coming from. That is problematic because if we are referencing this AI chatbot as a source of truth, but we don't know where said source of truth is coming from, well, you can see that it's clearly not coming from the libraries of Alexandria. Which brings me to the blind spots of the general AI community as well as academia. Now, in terms of the legalities, which we'll get into in a second, the legal issues around AI are intrinsically tied to the societal issues. One could argue that they are one and the same. Specifically, later on in the video, we'll talk about cultural appropriation and whether or not we need a bunch of digital dolezals running around. Digital dolezals. Identify as black. Digital dolezals. Shrink, shrink, blinkity blink. Try to make me think. Digital dolezals. Big up, big up the whole island, massive, it's your boy Chetana. Digital dolezals. A limb, ten, nine. I would say the answer is no. Outside of cultural appropriation, another aspect of issues stems from one large blind spot, which at large, the majority of AI researchers, companies producing AI chatbots, Lenza, which is a company that produces artificial intelligence art, they're in a lawsuit, which we'll get into in a second, is that a lot of these very learned experts tend to share the same exact blind spot. So from the stochastic parrot's paper, furthermore, the tendency of human interlocutors to impute meaning where there is none can mislead both natural language processing researchers and the general public into taking synthetic text as meaningful, combined with the ability of language models to pick up on both subtle biases and overtly abuse language patterns and training data. This leads to risk of harms, including encountering derogatory language and experiencing discrimination at the hand of others who reproduce racist, sexist, ableist, extremist, or other harmful ideologies reinforced through interactions with synthetic language. Yes. And again, reference back to how a large language model is built. It's programmed. Humans program the algorithm. And if all those humans sitting in the room programming the algorithm together are one and the same, and maybe have a lot of internal and external biases, you see how the algorithm is then biased as well. So Forbes put out this mini documentary on YouTube, which is linked below, which I thought was really interesting. However, there were a few very apparent blind spots. One, there are no women interviewed in the entire documentary. Not one of any race. Two, there are no black people interviewed in the entire documentary of any gender. That also reflects the issues in artificial intelligence as a field. It should be noted that only 14% of AI researchers are women. The Stochastic Parrot's paper, however, is an anomaly in that the few women in the field decided to come together to speak about the issues that are going on in AI. In the Forbes mini documentary, black people are only shown for about 40 seconds as a periphery, as charity that AI could help destitute people in far off sub-Saharan Africa. As if ignoring all of the issues of black people over here in the United States. Colonization has a funny way of trying to act like people over there have a problem as if the people over here don't have said same problem. Interesting. And before anyone has the absolute uninformed caucasity to state that maybe not enough women are interested in artificial intelligence as a whole, the article again, Stochastic Parrots, which is peer reviewed and cited by the majority of AI researchers today is written by four women. One of who is Timnit Gebru, who was fired from Google for raising to Google that, hey, these programs have some issues. We should talk about it. And the paper she was writing at the time was the Stochastic Parrots paper. Ironic. In December 2nd of 2020, Timnit tweeted this out. Apparently my manager's manager sent an email, my direct report saying she's accepted my resignation. I hadn't resigned. I had asked for simple conditions first and said I would respond when I'm back from vacation. But I guess she decided for me. Smiley face. That's the lawyer speak. Wow. Which, speaking of lawyers, let's get into the legal issues, particularly the IP rights around artificial intelligence. 
So first, let's start with privacy. It should be noted that the privacy laws in the United States are flimsy at best. The U.S. notoriously has very weak privacy laws compared to the other colonizers. I mean, developed world. Mm hmm. However, we can kind of place together our mismatch of privacy rights here in the United States. Essentially, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Privacy Act of 1974, and the CCPA, which is the California Consumers Privacy Act, collectively enshrine the disparate aspects of our flimsy privacy rights in this country. With the CCPA trying to lead the way on consumer privacy rights to ensure that, you know, companies aren't exploiting your deep desire to buy really shiny earrings. However, we've seen what big tech and companies at large care and do with what little privacy rights we have. Insert Meta's lawsuit in which they're now settling for the literal debacle they have created from using people's data in ways that harm them, ah, harmed an election, plowed away at what's left of democracy. But hey, go ahead and sign up for that settlement and get your probably 15 to 20 ish bucks. No, but seriously, you deserve some free money for all the harm that has come to you. I signed up for it. You also waive your rights when you agree to these settlements. So let me just put that in there. One of the biggest privacy implications with AI and ChatGPT, for example, is where is all this data being mined? And we'll get into the specifics, but some of it is being mined from Reddit, which who knows what's on there, social media, Wikipedia, very little having to do with digital libraries. I wish they would license the information from some books, some real life books, so that way people could get something sensible into their mind. Speaking of privacy, let's talk about the Lenza AI complaint. So according to the complaint against Lenza AI, Lenza illegally extracted users' facial data to train its models. So AKA, if you put your face into the app or your friend's face into the app, you have, you know, essentially given your face and your biometric data to Lenza, unbeknownst to you. And yes, that is illegal on their end, according to this allegation. Some users have also decried the app's supposed penchant for lightening skin, thinning bodies, and churning out sexualized nudes without users' consent. Specifically, the way the Lenza app worked is you would put your face into Lenza, and then it would create some beautiful artwork of you, unless you were brown, a woman, you know, had darker skin, etc. Because if you're any of those things, you were gonna get some very odd results. And by odd, I mean, you're most likely to be a completely different complexion. And if you're a woman, it would just take your regular face like this and then draw you with some double Ds. Which while yes, I'm not opposed to having double Ds, that's a little strange to sexualize all the women, don't you think? So according to the complaint, the app's magic avatars feature requires users to upload at least eight photos of themselves. Lenza then uses the uploaded selfies to create art-enhanced stylized avatar based on the user's face. The magic avatars are produced in a variety of user-selected styles such as cosmic anime or fairy princess. And then you pay. You pay and they keep your biometric data and they spew out this artwork. Now, although the app is promoted as a mean of creating personal magic avatar for the users, users are not required to upload solely their own selfies for the generation of the magic avatar image. A user can create an avatar for anyone by uploading a collection of non-user images and avatars of celebrities not created by the celebrity themselves, which is an issue. And there's nothing to stop a user from providing images from an ex-spouse, partner, school friend, unfriendly neighbor, or family member, even for insidious purposes. I had to kindly tell a friend not to upload my face into these things. Because listen, you do not know what the companies do with your data. That is largely the big issue. Now, if we had any sense in this country in terms of our government and actually had some proper privacy rights, we would do something similar to what the EU and Italy is doing, which Italy put a temporary suspension on ChatGPT so that way their AI researchers and scientists could understand exactly what the program was doing, how it was ingesting information, and to ensure that it wasn't causing citizen harm. Wow, look at that. Letting your citizens' taxpayers work for them. Let's get on to IP ownership. The big question with Lenza as well as Midsummer and the other art AI websites is, is the AI, aka the large language model, actually creating new artwork or is it just teething from other artists? And you know what? According to the artists, it's the latter. Since AI is simply ingesting large data sets, which often include copyrighted works, AI is essentially stealing from other artists. And I've seen the AI generate things and I'm like, oh yeah, I know exactly which anime that came from. 
It's causing huge copyrighted issues. And to be honest, because this video is already going to be a bit long, we don't even have the time to get into what AI is going to and doing to the music industry which we've all heard the weekend Drake mashups, which are neither the weekend nor Drake. Not gonna lie, some of them do sound all right. But again, it's stealing from artists with a no promise of pay, no consent, no licensing structure, nothing. So specifically with Lenza, according to the complaint, to create the avatars, the app uses Stable Diffusion, an open source AI model, which was originally trained on 2.3 billion caption images from the internet. Images from sites like Pinterest, SmugMug, Flickr, DeviantArt, ArtStation, Getty, and Shuttershop. To be noted, a lot of small artists, specifically illustrators, use DeviantArt to show their artwork. Many of those images are copyrighted and artists have complained that apps using Stable Diffusion to create unique images such as Lenza violate the copyright to the art they have posted online. One Twitter user identified more than two dozen Lenza created magic avatars just from her own timeline. You know, in a society that loves to be like, oh, the starving artist, the starving artist, we sure are keeping them starving. It's interesting to know in terms of ownership, we discussed over on Patreon, which is up for all the tiers on Patreon, who owns the copyrighted work that ChatGPT co-creates with users. And according to the current ChatGPT terms and conditions, heavy emphasis on current, you, the user, own any output. However, there's something baked into those terms and conditions which states you can own the copyright as long as you comply with the terms and conditions. Having had to update and write terms and conditions for many of the companies that I work for, you can update them as a company unilaterally at any time. A regular, regular person, much less anybody, to be honest, that doesn't have lots of free time, is not going to check every five seconds to make sure that they're in compliance. It should be noted that most companies, when they do update their T's and C's, they do send you an email. They're required to send you an email to tell you that they've changed them. They don't all comply with that rule though. It's interesting to note that in terms of copyright, the ownership for ChatGPT is the user. So if I go on ChatGPT and I say, hey, we're gonna write a novel about um, this young woman who decided that she wanna be a lawyer anymore, she's gonna be a content creator, et cetera, et cetera. ChatGPT, let us write the first paragraph together. Technically, the ethical thing to do when I list it on Barnes and Nobles would to be say, this is co-created between Stephanie and ChatGPT. So that is what you're starting to see a lot of authors are doing if they're listing their things on Amazon, etc. However, the copyright itself, who can license it, who can reproduce the work, who can make money off of it, solely goes to the human author. As of right now, I want to introduce y'all to Temi, one of the best art channels here on YouTube and a lovely human being from the UK. And we're going to talk with her about her feelings about AI and artwork and particularly the newest onset of AI um, in different companies like Lenza. And you know, how has that affected your artwork, if at all? Cool. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me, Stephanie. I'm so excited. Thank you for coming on here. No, thank you. And I mean, I do art content, so this is going to be different. I know. <laughs> like going into the legalities. I'm like, this is my feelings. And you're like, no, but the contract says. No, I want to know about your feelings because a lot of lawyers don't focus on that. And it's been really interesting and sad to me that the community hit first is the art community mm -hmm. that I think has been prepared the least to deal with AI. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And I think the most upsetting part is that this could actually be such a positive thing for us. So I suffer from something called aphantasia, which basically mm -hmm. means I can't imagine things. So if you close your eyes, some people can see, I don't know if you imagine a ball, they can see it on a table and they can see yeah. all of it. But personally, I can't see anything. So oh, in that yeah. sense, when it comes to doing art, I think it makes it more difficult for me because I cannot draw anything from my imagination. I always need a reference and using references isn't a problem with art. In fact, it's encouraged to be able mm -hmm. to get portions right, to be able to get perspective, everything. There's some references that sometimes you have to go into Photoshop and you have to really dig and like combine things before you can get your perfect reference. Mm -hmm. And AI art is actually meant to alleviate that. It's meant to help you just come up with those prompts so that you don't have to do all of that stress. So all of the negativity around it in terms of like how they are stealing the arts that they're- I'm doing. glad you said the word stealing from it's artists mm -hmm. yeah it's it's upsetting and I think that's what makes it so sad that this could have been such a positive overall but it has such a negative undertone I was more 
happy about it initially mm-hmm. like just the thought of oh my gosh I'll be able to find whatever reference and I'll be able to generate whatever reference you know with generative AI but all of the ideas behind the fact that for some of them they they've just taken your work from different websites so you think you're uploading onto DeviantArt I was uploading into DeviantArt since I was like 12 you think you're mm-hmm. uploading because you know this is a great way to share your art and I'm sorry Stephanie but no one's reading the T's and C's I know and I don't know what DeviantArt is but I just uploaded it thinking, and just like how you upload it anyway, you're building an audience, you're, you know, connecting mm-hmm. with your community, whatever else. And I think it's sad that they can just go there and take from different places. It's, it's actually crazy to think about. For art, from my understanding, it's similar to YouTube where you retain all the ownership, which is why for Lenza to be accused of literally scraping the images from art is stealing. As this goes on, because it's gonna continue to grow and there are like different lawsuits going on, do you think this will have an impact on your creator career since you're predominantly based on YouTube, right? Yeah, I am. I think with YouTube videos, what's so good about it, and that's why I love having YouTube as a medium, as an artist, is that not only am I creating art anyway, but I'm also telling a story through my videos. So I'm mm-hmm. also, you know, going through the entire process. And I think that's one big part that AI art cannot take from you. It, you mm-hmm. cannot see the journey and an algorithm or a, what do we call it? <laughs> the computer. You can The cannot- large language model. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. That's you, like, yeah. Yeah, you, you <laughs> cannot see the journey that it took to create that thing because it took it created it in three seconds and spat you out a hundred images but Mm. an artist would always be able to share the journey if they want to and I think for me that's why I'm not I'm not upset or I'm not scared about let's say what I create on YouTube because you know not only do I have the art it's also about me and my personality and my humanity Mm -hmm. through it so um in that sense yeah I'm not too fast but I think it's, it's scary like I'm, I'm not going to pretend that oh this is, none of this is scary to me it's quite scary but I think we're good for now like you can share your process and I would just urge artists out there even if you don't like sharing the behind the scenes I don't always like that either but even if you don't like it I would urge you to share it because it's so important for people to be able to see what you're going through and for you to share your experience through it people can look at a lot of my final pieces and they're just like oh my gosh they're amazing there's no way I would and they say whatever about it and I'm always grateful for the compliments but in my videos I always speak very clearly about whatever struggles I'm going through during the piece my feelings about the piece Mm -hmm. so that you know that it wasn't just a oh my gosh magic and this was it like that there's a human creating this (laughs) behind this yeah I love your videos. They're like super calming. And I think if they actually were to work on some type of licensing model, I think maybe that could work, you know, like, hey, tell me, do you want to license this series to me? We're going to pay you X amount a month. That might be like a viable way for artists to make money and then for the bot to do what it wants to do as well. The company of the different things. But like, that's not what they did. A hundred percent. Like, I would hundred percent be down for that because I'm sorry, passive income. Yes, please. Hello. But the, the fact is that you should be able to opt in and exactly. you should be able to, it, it shouldn't be like a all in and now, you know, now it's an issue. It's like, oh, opt in if you want to do that. Speaking about all of this, I'm actually glad we had this conversation now because last week I went to an Adobe event and they were Ooh. speaking about their new AI generative model mm-hmm. and um, it's called Adobe Firefly. And yes. it's yeah it's meant it's meant to be a lot more ethical in how they've actually sourced the art that they're using to so say they've got their adobe stock which is which already they have um different licensing deals with artists and photographers oh, nice. and all of this and they just kind of built up on it and to be honest i'm i'm very happy because adobe are massive in you know mm-hmm. the art graphic design photography space and they know that ai is coming so there's nothing that we can do. And even as an artist, it's like, I'm not going to be against it completely because at the end of the day, mm-hmm. we have no choice that it's coming. But for them to do it in a much more ethical way, I think is, is a lot more promising. And I feel like it's a great example for other companies to actually be like, okay, there is a better way that we could be doing this. I'm glad you said that because I had heard about Firefly, but I didn't know exactly what it was and it's doing. And I think to your point, that's great because the idea that, 
oh, well, we can't ethically do it. So we're just going to ask for forgiveness and not permission is foolishness mm -hmm. versus yeah. you can actually pay people like there are licensing models. That's nothing new. And a quick dishonorable mention in terms of all the things that AI we should kind of look out for is because artificial intelligence has a disclaimer in it, particularly ChatGPT, their chatbot stating like, hey, you should verify this information because it often spreads disinformation, which the owners of OpenAI and the creators of it, Sam Altman, are stating it's just hallucinations. Yeah. Mm hmm. The FTC is warning that AI technology like ChatGPT could lead to a spike in fraud, which, yeah, that's what we need. More scammers. Speaking of Sammers, let's talk about digital dolezals. Do y'all remember FN Mecca? The ugly image might be ingrained into your mind, but in case you are unfamiliar, thankfully, with FN Mecca, let me try my best to draw a picture for you. So the digital record label Factory New created an artist that was not real named FN Mecca. FN Mecca was then touted as the first AI rapper. Multiple issues with the first AI rapper, besides the overall fugliness, the fact that it was built off of a huge exaggeration of black stereotypes, was the fact that the voice was allegedly stolen from a black rapper. And again, FN Mecca was a white fictionalized rapper. Lord. The voice apparently didn't belong to an island boy. I can't stand them. It really pisses me off. As an island gal, I would really love to give them two Ross Lick, to be honest. The voice was allegedly stolen from a black artist who was promised equity in the venture. Well, at the time, like I was young, you know what I'm saying? I had no representation, so, and they didn't really have the money behind it as of yet, so they promised me equity. So I'm like, okay, I'm not, we're just gonna, I basically it was like a collaboration, so we could do this together and just like build it up instead of like upfront money and stuff like that. One thing to know about equity, as somebody who has gotten stock options from many startups, particularly startups that have literally gone to the wayside, ceased to exist because they ran out of VC money, venture capital, is equity is cute and all, but half of zero is what? Zero. Zero divided by zero is what? Zero. For your equity to ever be worth anything, the company has to do well. Most of the time, startups promise equity to newer employees in an effort to get you to buy in and to often pay you a little bit less with the promise that, hey, in five years, we're really going to take off and be a unicorn, which unicorns are startups that have valuations of one billion or more dollars. Literally less than 1% of all startups in the United States ever hit it to unicorn status. So yes, while I do think a little bit of blind optimism and faith in startup land is very much helpful when you work in tech, always take that with a grain of salt. According to Kyle, he claimed that he is the original voice of Mecca in the video that we just watched. The original part was posted to his Instagram and then he did another interview at TMZ. He stated that the company then ghosted him prior to Mecca signing with Capitol Records. So the company then signed with Capitol Records for a whopping 10 days before Capitol Records dropped them due to outrage. Because of course, a white bot saying the N word, being voiced by a black person. Anybody with two brain cells could have told you that this was gonna be the hot mess express. He added that the creators used his voice, used his sound, used the culture, and literally just left him high and dry. I didn't get a dime off of anything. They got the record deals. One of the interesting things, the two men behind FN Mecca are notably two white men, Anthony Martini and Brandon Lee. Martini, who has already been called out numerous times for his penchant use of the N-word in his song. The apple don't never fall far from the bot. And it should be noted that this is not new. The appropriation of black culture, specifically black American culture in this country is rampant. The Netflix documentary, Is That Black Enough For You? takes us through the timeline of black exploitation films, as well as how black culture has always been stolen from and then given a white face and a little revamp. With John Travolta in that movie being a great example. So let's get into erasure, appropriation's first cousin. Not to be outdone and to be left out into the appropriation cold, Levi was called out recently because instead of hiring Black and Hispanic and Indigenous models, they decided to just create them. You know, why pay real people when you can just make a bot? I hate it here. Side note, it is really ironic to me that the people who like to chant that racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic statement of 
replacement theory are literally never on the receiving end of erasure. Be serious. Like, be for real. Who wants to go outside in ugly khakis and a tiki torch? It's giving nothing. There's not even any glitter. The delusions of basic beige will never cease to amaze me. Now, Levi is not the first. Maybe they got this idea from the first AI supermodel, Shudu.gram. As you can see, Shudu is a beautiful dark-skinned bot who is giving you looks. However, Shudu is not run nor owned by any black person. The creator of Shudu is actually and allegedly a white British man. Oh, hell no! An Englishman at that. And Shudu is not the only one. With the now rampant adoption of AI, we are seeing lots and lots more digital dolezals of literal white people benefiting off of not just black skin, but the idea of blackness, blackness shaped in their own image. It's wildly problematic on multiple levels to steal someone else's culture under the guise of it's pop culture, it's black culture. And you borrowed it. You didn't even borrow it good. Feel away. But to then take it a step further and steal more jobs from black people under the guise of, well, I can make a better black than you. <sighs> I think we're past the sunken place. I think we've fallen to the pits of hell. Source of truth or fancy fables. Back to one of the statements I made in the beginning of this video, which is most people believe that ChatGPT is giving them correct or near correct information because of the way that ChatGPT can give you said information in a humanistic way. Because it's not saying I am C3PO and is instead saying, hi, Stephanie, do you know the weather today is going to be a lovely 82 degrees? You can wear those shorts you wanted to, et cetera, et cetera. You're more likely to believe that the weather is actually going to be a lovely 82 degrees. Now that we've seen how you can literally steal an entire culture and hide behind a computer screen, let's talk about how unreliable AI actually is and why no one should use ChatGPT or any type of AI at this point as any absolute source of truth. Remember Wikipedia back in the day? Wikipedia now is legitimate. However, when Wikipedia first started, because of its decentralized nature, there were a lot of people that went onto Wikipedia and said foolishness. They would change different pictures, claim to be the Queen of England, misrepresent represent history, etc. So much so that when I was in college back in the day, you were not allowed to use Wikipedia as a source. It has changed very much now. Wikipedia is full of citations. It's excellent. It very much helps people who don't have access to things. Let us all think of ChatGPT as early version of Wikipedia. I think that will help us all a lot. Remember that the AI is only as smart as the data sets you feed it. So if you feed it foolishness, all it's going to know is foolishness. And particularly because, again, the large language models are based on the algorithm, it has been algorithmically programmed to give you answers. Therefore, sometimes ChatGPT, the chatbot, has hallucinations. Ho hallucin. Lord. There's a lovely documentary on coded bias that specifically talks about how you can program biases into code. I highly recommend that you give it a watch. When you think of AI, it's forward looking, but AI is based on data and data is a reflection of our history. So the past dwells within our algorithms. This data is showing us the inequalities that have been here. Dr. Joy Bulalamwini, MIT researcher, Rhodes Scholar and Fulbright Scholar. So back to stochastic parrots, because if we're all of the understanding that you can program the algorithm that then sources the information from any old where, what exactly are the data sets in a lot of these AI programs? So from section 4.2 of the stochastic parrots paper, size doesn't guarantee diversity. For instance, GPT-2's training data is sourced by scraping outbound links from Reddit and Pew Internet Research's 2016 survey reveals 67% of Reddit users in the United States are men and 64% between ages 18 and 29. Similarly, recent surveys of Wikipedians, these are the people that are actually inputting the information into Wikipedia, find that only 8.8 to 15% are women or girls. In all cases, the voices of people most likely to hew to a hegemonic viewpoint are also more likely to be retained in ChatGPT. 
for example, in those data sets. In the cases of US and UK English, this means that white supremacist and misogynistic ageist views are overrepresented in the training data, not only exceeding their prevalence in the general population, but also setting up models trained on these data sets to further amplify biases and harms. Yeah. Interesting thing, when I put a clip of the video about ChatGPT and how the algorithm is only as good as the people who program it, the white men of TikTok were a little upset. So much so that a few stitched a video, to which I then just deleted the video to be honest, because I'm not about to argue with a 16 year old literally in their mama's house. From TechCrunch, due to the nature of how these models work, they don't know or care whether something is true, only that it looks true. That's a problem when you're using it to do your homework, sure, but when it accuses you of a crime you didn't commit, that may well at this point be libel. It's almost as if you allow solely and emboldened white men to program these things they program themselves. Hmm. If you feel a way, reflect in the mirror. They don't know or care if something is true, just rather that it appears to be true. Do you know how many meetings I sat through in corporate where I was like, this is a crock of shit. That's wildly incorrect. But Chad Brad and Thad said it with conviction, so everyone nodded. It's giving board member of a Wall Street bank a la 2008. The future is iRobot. Just kidding. No, really, just kidding. Before we jump into mass hysteria, there is hope on the horizon. I truly believe that we, the humans, the sentient beings, can get it together. Jeffrey Hinton is largely recognized as the godfather of AI, and when interviewed after leaving his post at Google because he largely has concerns and doesn't agree with the direction that big tech is taking in AI, he stated, his immediate concern is that the internet will be flooded with false photos, videos, and texts, and the average person will not be able to know what is true anymore. The amount of people that really thought the Pope was really wearing that puffer jacket. Smart people, sensible people. And truthfully, at first, I was like, oh, he has a new wardrobe, until I looked a little harder. It's usually the hands. AI cannot yet mimic hands very well. Once you look at the hands, the fingers are usually oddly long. So you may have saw in the news that lots of very wealthy people, smart people, AI researchers spoke out against AI and asked for a six month pause. This seemed well and good at first until you look and see who signed their name, specifically Elon Musk and Peter Thiel of Palantir. If you don't know what Palantir does, it's wildly problematic trifling things, such as deport people, such as infiltrate organizations in order to assist in deportations. However, the initial letter was mostly for commercial reasons. Elon wanted to make sure that he got his coins, you know, because he's losing a lot of money with Twitter because he doesn't really know how to run a business. But the Tesla employees could have told you that. The initial letter didn't give any credence to the biases, the unethical behavior, the copyright stealing, etc., that is going on with ChatGPT and AI, aka machine learning on steroids in general. The response letter, however, highlighted that yes, this technology can be useful, but like everything in the world, it needs parameters. On Tuesday, March 28th, the Future of Life Institute published a letter asking for a six month minimum moratorium on training AI systems more powerful than ChatGPT4. Signed by more than 2,000 people, including Turning Award winner Yoshua ben -Gio and one of the world's richest men, Elon Musk. Never forget, when a billionaire wants something, we should always question why. The original letter addresses none of the ongoing harms from these systems, including one, worker exploitation and massive data theft to create products that profit a handful of entities, two, the explosion of synthetic media in the world, which both reproduces systems of oppression and endangers our information ecosystem, and three, the concentration of power in the hands of a few people, which exacerbates social inequities. The majority of people working on artificial intelligence reside in Silicon Valley. And I don't know if you've ever been over there or you've ever worked anybody that happens to live in Silicon Valley. The hubris of the inhabitants of said valley. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so don't worry, large language models are not gonna take over the world. But the corporations that control said large language models are gonna continue doing what corporations do, which is yes, take over the damn world. 
However, there's hope because there are other institutions that are not only fighting big tech, but are pushing back on how do we properly build these new technologies to benefit everyone. Specifically, you have the Distributed AI Research Institute and the Algorithm Justice League. And while these are just a few examples, these institutes are run by people who have combined decades of experience as well as real life application on how do we use these systems to better help each other. So on that note, lower your blood pressure, but also make sure you tell people that ChatGPT is not a source of truth. And if we see an AI model, it's probably not run by somebody that looks like said AI model. I want to say a huge thank you to my patrons, specifically Judy, Juanita, Courtney, and Edna. All right, I'll catch you on the next video.